today's webinar is all about 10 childhood games that you can begin playing today, or maybe it's too late today, but you can begin <laughs> playing tomorrow to help your child develop self-control. Well, thank you so much for joining us here live. I'm Bonnie. This is Thomas Leota, and we are the founders of Creating Champions for Life. And just a little bit about my story is that back in 2011, I was a single mom with four kids under the age of 13. I had been seeing psychologists, talking to teachers and principals all about this ADHD for already six years and didn't have one solid solution to work with with um, in my home that would actually get results. So here I was, I was a success coach and business leader, and I was on the floor of my bathroom, literally in fetal position, bawling my eyes out, praying to God for answers, because there must be a better way to raise my kids. They were just completely out of control. And so I met Thomas, thankfully, uh, on a cruise ship in the Bahamas in January of 2011, we got to know each other over about three or four months. I invited him to Canada, not knowing that he knew anything about kids at all. But when I saw him speak with my kids, uh, I just saw different results right away. I saw, you know, life light up in their eyes. I saw basically like a new zest for life, right? Excitement. I saw um, happiness to do chores and to engage. And uh, after about six months of studying him, I walked away from my business world. I walked away from my seven bedroom house and everything to bring this to life so that every mom in the whole world could have the exact same results. And I'm talking happy, healthy, cooperative kids, harmony in the home, teamwork, empowerment, and kids that were being labeled ODD uh, turn into rock star champion, outstanding kids. And I know it can be hard for some of you to believe, especially if you're just like me, pulling your hair out in the bathroom, looking for solutions, reading all the parenting books and whatnot, but it is true. And we're going to shed some light on this today. So now a little bit about self-control. What does that have to do with the ADHD and ODD group? Well, when we look at what ADHD is, we know that is the inability to focus and hyperactive or impulsive behavior, right? And so when you sum that all up, it basically means the lack of the ability of self-control. Uh, oppositional defiant disorder, if you have basically uh, head-butting power struggles with your child and they have angry outbursts and throw things and hit things and kick things and yell and you get the same result for more than six months, well, that child's going to be diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and the things that they both have in common are the lack of self-control. Self-control is the balance wheel that directs your actions so that it will build up and not tear down. How awesome would that be if you could be equipped with some parenting tools that would um, allow your family to grow in a more positive way and build up rather than break down and tear down everything? Because I know that oppositional defiant disorder can really cause a lot of stress in mental health, spiritually, financially, relationally. And I know this because we talk with hundreds of parents um, and we ask them these questions. And so the results are typically the same. I wanted to share with you that a survey that was completed, and this was back in the 1930s or 1940s because I found it in a book called The Laws of Success. And it was written by Napoleon Hill. It's about 600 pages long. <laughs> if you ever want to know what all the laws of success are, it's in there. But he says that he surveyed over 160,000 inmates, uh, people that were in prison, both male and female. And what he discovered was that 92% of all prison inmates are there because they lacked self-control to direct their energy constructively. So I want you to think about, um, you know, a child that never develops the habit of self-control growing up in this world and turning 17, 18, 21, 25, and the issues that could arise if we don't take the time to instill this in our children are, well, prison, 
teenage pregnancies, loss of opportunity, loss of jobs, loss of relationships, right? Because if you can't maintain self-control and your 18 year old or 19 year olds in a nightclub and they get into a fight with another guy and they don't have any of that. Well, I saw a gentleman that had a, a beer bottle cut in half and stabbed in his eye. Like things can happen, right? So let's fast forward our children's lives. Let's have a little bit of vision and just know that unless we can equip them with self-control, um, they're basically going to be stuck in this negative uh, wheel that will spiral out of control. And the worst part is, is that the prison inmates or our children say, they don't know that it is this missing life skill. They think it's who they are. And so they internalize and take it personally, like I can't control myself or I'm a terrible person. Um, and that's not the truth. Your child has pure potential to be, do, and have um, whatever it is that they would choose. But self-control is going to be a great starting point because without it, it's just like... Um, it's just like electricity that has not been directed, right? Lightning can strike anywhere at any time. You know what I'm talking about. All right. So um, we can try to control their behavior. We can punish their outbursts or their temper temp tantrums with timeouts and takeaways, or we can teach them self-control. What do you think is going to be the best solution moving forward? And I know there's a little bit of a delay, so we're not going to wait that long. I'm going to uh, pass the microphone over to Thomas. Thomas has worked with children since he was 17 years old when he started coaching Little League Baseball. And um, he also, I think this is imperative to know too, he also grew up with dyslexia. And I know that we can look at the uh, dyslexia like it's some sort of disorder or handicap, but really it gave Thomas the ability to see both sides of the coin. And so he brought into his martial arts school back in 1994, made a decision to guide all of his students with the opposite of anything negative. So the words, no, don't, can't stop. We don't do that. Punishment of any kind was taken off the table and he learned how to guide these children. And he had uh, literally thousands of students come through his school. And some of them he took from these childhood labels and worked with them to become Olympia, Olympic champions. <laughs> All right. That's um, a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah. I've seen Thomas in um, several different environments with children and he's always the one that the children, uh, the children all flock to because he takes the time to teach them life skills. We've all heard that all children require attention. We can give them reactive negative attention or we can give them proactive attention. And I'm going to share my screen and Tom is going to share um, an aha moment with you basically. Just give me one moment here. Okay, all right. So, all right, Tom, share the FedEx arrow. Oh, I like this one. This is so much fun. All right, so let's see who is open to interact. One of the neatest things about our interaction is it's a two-way street. The more you put in, the more you'll get back. So plug and play, just do something. So share what you see. You know, when we first think about this, people will go, oh, it's uh, FedEx. And do we have any messages coming through? There might be a delay, but we'll play with it. There's a little bit of a delay, so. All right. So when you look at it, you're probably going to go, well, it's a, it's a logo, uh, FedEx. You're looking at the letters, which is what we've been conditioned to look at. So what if there was something there that you're looking at, but you don't see? You know, you're looking at your children who have this label, they have something that seems to not be working right, but there's something magical there that we don't see yet. Can you give yourself permission to be open-minded and see it? I do, I do. All right, so when you look at FedEx, the question that you might ask, and if you know this before, it's like a magic trick. You already know what's gonna happen, but give yourself permission to look at this. Do you see the arrow? And at first you're gonna go, arrow, what arrow? I see F-E-D-E-X. You see, 
we have lots of different uh, intelligence, and one of them is spatial or negative space. So we've been trained to look at the letters. So with that being said, we have the ability to put our attention wherever we like it to go. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's, uh, uh, think of the initials R-A-S, RAS. All right, so give yourself permission to put your attention here. Look between the large E and the little X. Look at the absence space. And when you see it, it'll like just jump right out at you like, there it is. Oh my gosh, I never saw that before. Where was it? You see, what's so unique about this is one time we were at the office and this was, gosh, I'm thinking probably a good 10 years ago. We were talking about this concept and lo and behold, a van pulls, like a big truck pulls into the parking lot and was delivering a package and yep, it was a FedEx truck delivery. And so we got talking to the uh, driver and we're like, hey, this is great. How long have you been working for the company? Eight years. He was bragging kind of boastfully and feeling good. And we're like, well, gosh. And, and then somebody in the group, because we we're talking, goes, well, when did you see the arrow? <laughs> and the driver was like, arrow? What arrow? <laughs> and so we explained it. We shared the same thing. He saw it and he went, oh, they must have just added that. You're right. <laughs> so here he is, right? Like, this is a little awkward. You're like, okay, so I'm, I'm going to bring to your attention, you've been driving for FedEx for eight years and nobody told you about the arrow. Wow. And it was there the whole time. And some of you that are maybe on the advanced level, right? You know about the arrow. 99% of the time, nobody ever asks you. The second question is, where's the spoon? Yeah. Yeah. Go play with that one for a while. <laughs> Back to you, Bonnie. Yeah. I've noticed there's a few comments like the arrow, the arrow, and Susanna said um, the arrow first. So she said the arrow before you showed the arrow, but then I was going to say, but can you see the spoon? All right. There's <laughs> hidden messages behind everything. We just got to be willing to know that there's something there that you might not see yet. Mm -hmm. So I want you to just imagine your child being a master of their own emotions like imagine your seven-year-old ODD child being able to take a timer an egg timer turn it on and breathe and count to 10 and then be calm imagine that because they do have the ability to learn if we have the ability to teach them I would say the ability and the will to teach them imagine your child acting in a loving and cooperative manner every single day all day long and yes it is possible Imagine working with your child in harmony, like as a team, like side by side like this, rather than opponents like that, right? Imagine taking the stress and anxiety out of your parenting by doing and planning everything proactively. And that's what we're going to talk to you about today. So here's the formula, you guys. This is the formula. This is like looking at the FedEx arrow and not seeing the arrow at all when somebody asks you, which Tom and I actually, that was our very first argument before we actually even met was over the FedEx arrow. <laughs> but the formula that we've been operating with is we have a child's defiant behavior. Now let's go back to when your child was say 18 months to two years old and we all hear the term terrible twos don't we we know this term um, and why is that is because when a baby becomes around the ages of 18 months to two years old they begin to crave I do it myself or look what I can do and they start to crave more responsibility and some independence and definitely control over themselves right but for about 100 years, well, about 85 to be exact, we've been operating with this formula. So we start with the child's what we perceive as defiant behavior, and we add it with a reaction and usually we catch our child being defiant um, and we react to them we're reacting with negativity. We don't do that. No, stop it. Um, you're in a timeout. Now you're screaming. Now you're in your room or whatever it is. We react to the child's defiant behavior. And if I were to ask, I'd love a little interaction. Even if you're just watching the replay, it would be amazing. Um, 
Would you be getting a positive or negative result guaranteed using this formula, the formula that we know so well since Dr. Spock's book, Baby and Child Care 1946? And no, scroll up. Okay. There's a little bit of a lag. I know you're all typing your answers in now. Okay. <laughs> all right. And so we are going to be guaranteed at dun, 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 negative results. It, sa it says reaction, but it should say negative results. So a child's defiant behavior plus a parent's angry reaction guarantees you negative results every single time. Now, wait a minute. Can I just ask a quick question about that? And thank you, Kelly. Negative is correct. Yeah, negative, 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 negative. So if I'm hearing you correct, Bonnie, a child's just doing something, right? Something that's um, maybe impulsive or just something that's important to them. And we perceive it or we see it as something that we don't like. Right. We perceive it. It's our perception. Right. Kind of like uh, the little toddler just running because they're like, oh, look, I can get my feet going. But they don't see the staircase over there. Mm -hmm. So the parent sees it as, uh-oh, something wrong. Or better yet, when the child first learns that, no. You remember that one, that little terribles too? Well, my goodness, it's amazing because the results or the, um, uh, what is it? The, oh, the research was showing <laughs> that literally, out of yes and no, how many no's did a child hear before age two versus yes? And it's astoundingly skewed to the word no. So when they start echoing back no, yeah, kind of brings a little light to the subject. Right. So we tell our child, no, stop it. Don't do that. Can't. And then the two-year-old starts repeating no. Every time you ask them a question, no, and then you perceive it as being defiant, but really they're little beings who need to learn how the world works. They have no idea how the world works. All babies are born with basically like, if you were an artist, it, they would be born with a blank canvas, right? If you were a computer, take a computer. When you buy a computer from the computer store, it comes as a blank canvas awesome. and yeah, just hardware. And then you need to add software based on what you do and your personality and whatnot. Like your software on your computer, it's probably completely different than my software. So it's the exact same. Computers were actually made to resemble the human brain. And so isn't that amazing? You get the computer, there's no software on it. You have this complete blank slate that you have the opportunity to paint any picture that you like. And I just want to say this, if you're experiencing ADHD, ODD, anxiety, depression, any of those things with your children, it is not your fault. You've literally been trained and wired to follow that formula. And this is why when I met Thomas and I saw what he was doing, it matched everything I had learned in personal development in the 18 year history uh, before Thomas in personal development. So when he said, we begin with the child's goal, I'm like, Wow, that matches like everything I ever learned in business. Where are you going to go without a goal? Nowhere. We, we must have goals or things that we're working towards. Otherwise, we spend our days running around like, like a spinny top, right? <laughs> reacting, hitting the wall over here and reacting. So if we begin with the child's goal, and let's say your two-year-old wants a cookie, right? I want a cookie. Then what you do is instead of telling the child no and then having a temper tantrum, which I think we talked about a little bit on last week's webinar, how to calm a meltdown, this is preventing meltdowns right here. This is empowering your child to know how precious and special and loved they are. When you're on their side, when we understand that we're here to help our children reach their goals by teaching them how to reach it, Everything in your world will change. So we begin with the child's goal. I want a cookie. I want to watch TV. I want ketchup on my hot dog. I want sugar on my oatmeal. Like whatever it is that is over and above basic food, clothes, and shelter is called a goal. It's a privilege that your child can now work towards by engaging with these games that Tom's going to teach you about in just a minute, right? So we have the child's goal plus a parent-approved plan. I would love for you to have that be that or do that. Here's all you need to do. And so if your 10-year-old wants to get her nose pierced, 
gosh, wouldn't that be cool? What is it about nose piercing that you like? Well, you know, when you're legally able to get your nose pierced at the actual store, we can talk about that again when you're 14. And at least you're offering some sort of parent approved plan. They're not going to get it right away, but you're not telling them no, which means you're not in opposition. You are their teammate moving forward. So child's goal plus parent approved plan is going to give you positive, positive reaction, positive results, I should say. Again, human beings make mistakes, right? All right. Child's goal plus parent approved plan equals positive reaction. So now you're going to get your children to engage in these childhood games with you because you're going to help your children reach their goals through a little bit of practice and a little bit of role play. How much does that make sense to you moms, dads, teachers, educators, whoever's watching this webinar? I'm gonna look for your answers in just a moment. Yeah. You guys are this itty bitty picture of the right corner. Aw, um, ah, thank you. We're gonna be we're gonna be a gigantic picture in the right corner here soon. I hope with your help uh, for sure. Okay, so when we talk about negative results versus positive results, this is what we mean. Child acts out. You perceive it as poor behavior. We punish it. You're going to be angry. A positive would be understanding. I understand that you're two, three, five, seven, thirteen, and you're just a baby mind and you have no idea how the world works. Let me show you how to do this correctly. So um, instead of saying, nope, we don't bang a glass on a glass table, which is correct, by the way, we would say, oh my gosh, you love to bang. I, I want you to bang too. Here, why don't we bang on this? And then you guide them to where they can bang versus distracting them with a TV or here's my phone or something. Are you with me? Say yes, okay? So we're gonna take anger and turn it to understanding. Uh, I hate, I hate you. You're the worst parent in the world. I remember Christy when she was five, she was so cute. She was like two feet tall and she had hair down to her butt. <laughs> and she'd be like, I don't care about any of you. Stomp, 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 stomp to her room. I wish none of you were here, right? This hate vibration that we get from our kids. And we're going to transform that to love. Gosh, mom, I love you so much. Cause you know what? You never tell me no. I don't always get what I want, but you always show me how to make it happen. And I really, really love that about you. That's the new conversation you're going to have with your children. You go from being their opponent. No, I don't believe in that. I don't want you to do that to a teammate. I'm on your side. And even though I might not agree, let me teach you about it. For moms of teenagers, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I'm sorry. They're going to learn about it. So be their teammate and teach them about it rather than just saying, no, over my dead body, are you going to this party? Because I promise you, they will become oppositional, rebellious, and they will find a way. Ask me because I know I was there. I remember. All right. We're going to go from dictating, do this and, and, you know, do that and no and yes. And Hey, put your seatbelt on. We're going to go from dictating to motivating, authentically motivating your child with what's important to them. And we're going to finish with this lack of self-control would be negative. That would be a little baby mind who has developed zero neural pathways in their brain of what it is to maintain self-control. Breathing, walking away, keeping hands to oneself. Self-control would be the opposite of that. And that would be a positive result that we're looking for. And all you have to do is just change the formula from the child's poor behavior to the child's goal, and you're going to begin seeing these really amazing results. Okay, so now we're going to get to it. How many like awesome sauce messages am I going to get? Give me awesome if you're on track with me, or let me know if you have any questions or comments or observations at this time, and we will address them. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right, we're back with you now. So, Thomas, you have 10 childhood games that are going to help parents teach their children self-control because we have a really engaged group here mm -hmm. with our CCFL, ADHD, and ODD group. Um, and they really, really are eager and hungry to learn. Mm -hmm. So what would be the first game that you want to teach them? Okay. 
Well, one of the things about games is you look for the one that's actually awake the most. And I'm going to ask Bonnie to keep an eye open on who's actually typing in because that's the one I would first look for before I chose any type of game. So uh, who's, who's been the biggest contributor so far I as far as interaction? Marta, Ruth, Brittany, uh, Kara. Okay. So we have a poll. So this is great. We're in tune. We're doing the opposite of being impulsive where you're over here, over there, over there. You're right here. You're engaged. This is great. So at Creating Champions for Life, when you look at the word self-control, controlling oneself, we believe the definition is this. I am, right? We're, this is self-talk. I'm, I'm introducing that software to my hardware, right? That's my missing life skill. I'm having a commitment here. I am in control of my body and my actions. If you had a choice. Sorry, okay. Cara. Cara, sorry. All she, right, great. She corrected oh, me. Oh, yeah, me, me, me. I was there. <laughs> if you're going to have a choice in life, right? And if you're in a car that's driving and there's nobody else in there, would you rather be the passenger or would you like to be in the driver's seat? Because if this car is going to go off a cliff, would you like a fighting chance? You want to be able to at least grab a hold of the wheel and maybe turn it or push some buttons or pedals or something, or just sit there going, ah, right? That's the idea. I am in control of my body and my actions. And if there's any truth to that, then you start having a choice of that negative side or the positive side. And if you're with me on that, go ahead and type in yes. All right. So, when you, when you watch kids play, or when you begin to see them learn, they just grab something and they just start to play. That's where we learn the most. That's why games are so imperative at the younger age. Somewhere along the line, we kind of grew out of playing games, didn't we, Bonnie? Mm -hmm. All the time. Oh, and about 85 years ago, we stopped actually teaching, and that's when we went from control or we went from teaching life skills and playing these childhood games to trying to control our child's behavior. That's exactly when it happened. Mm -hmm. 100%. Now, may, many of you, I want to just take a moment here to shout out for Bonnie is, she is amazing. This lady is amazing. Just, really. if you haven't read the Raising Healthy, Happy Cooperative Kids yet, which goes back into history, shows how we got here, and then you can see it and then know there's hope that there's a, something you can do and then there's healing, there's a path to follow. This lady brought it to the table because we're here today 100% or 99.9999% because of her. And if you agree on any level, there's a round of applause. <laughs> Type in, yes, she is. Bonnie <laughs> rocks. Aww. Yes. Okay, so games, right? The idea about games, and I wrote down a couple notes here, and I'd like you to really take notes to some of this, right? Just really take it to heart. But games are that are requiring to control impulses and movements, right? And so kids can increase their self-control over their own thoughts, their emotional responses, better known as feelings, and their actions, going three for three, thoughts, feelings, and actions. And when you put those three together, that's when the magic really starts to manifest. Mm -hmm. Just like a fire, three elements, boom, something happens. Mm -hmm. Water, two hydrogen, one oxygen. So let's jump into this. We know that there's missing life skills that when you engage in the game, that is what manifests and creates that uh, Bonnie talked about the neural pathways. It, it's through the repetition. It's not just breathing once, eating once, walking once. It's actually repetition because it comes automatic. That's what's key. All right. So get things started. Here is like, say, the top 10 list, right? This is like a David Letterman for those of you that know who he was, right? But number 10 would be like, say, I spy. Who can remember this game? You're in a car, you're on a long drive, and you're like, okay, I spy with my green eye something that is green and tall. And see, people start to 
either engage or disengage, but the ones that start to engage, what does it really do? It gets you to start to think, huh, well, what is this person seeing? Well, that's brown, so that don't count. Well, that's white, that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. you, you can start to see that it's like they're playing like some hide and go seek concept, right? They're going out there and then you give them another clue. Okay, well, you water it, right? It has a brown trunk. And then all of a sudden, People who start to put the puzzle piece together are thinking, go, I know, or they might ask a question, it's a tree. Wow, oh, look at that, you got it right. But the idea is I spy allows the ability for me to see what I'm thinking and what I see and what I'm feeling for this person, for both of us to connect. Mm. Do you see the power? I mean, it's the, the, the benefits go infinity deep but what it did is it took two individuals right keyword individual right and it allowed us to come together on one point which is what the eagle eye and everybody knows that an eagle eye we can teach your kids that an eagle has this eye that can see like eight times bigger stronger than a human eye mm -hmm. that's why it's called eagle eye right it's kind of neat so when you start taking practicalities for this, right? Can we get into that right now? Just a little bit? Okay. All right. So if you're in the grocery store, right? How do you bring this to real life? It'd be like, ah, well, with my eagle eye, I see a box of breakfast cereal that is orange. Ooh, right? As they can start to see. Or I might be finding a loaf of bread that has a green sticker on it. Mm -hmm. You start to get the idea. It's allowing you to both come together into one. Yeah. Oh, and I wanted to say too that I spy will also help your child develop the neural pathway of focus because just for that few minutes uh, that they're like spying your something green, whether it be the sign or whatever, they're learning to focus their attention on that sign or whatever it is that they're looking for. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Here's another game that we would play. It was called I Can Control Blank. Now, this is really kind of a neat thing because it opens up the blank for, well, you guessed it. You fill in the blank. So, uh, eye-hand coordination, right? Eye and hand. What a great game to play. We'd start the kids off on one end, and they'd be like, okay, right? And, and, and the kids would always start with I Can Control, and you have all kinds of things over here. Mm -hmm. So let's just pick blocks, right? I can control a stack of blocks. Well, how many is that stack, right? Because see, they already started with the goal. You ask questions. I don't say they can or can't. We're just like, well, how many blocks is that stack? Ah, uh, well, once again, they got to think on their own rather than pick up three, carry it over there, right? That's like a dictator game. Huh. Well, not really good at it. Like this is internal thinking, I'm a little embarrassed, I don't want anybody to laugh at me, but I'm gonna do one block, right? Then there's two, there's three, it gives them a chance to build. I can control this stack of blocks from here to there. And when they do, they get one of the coolest feelings in the world of, oh, look what I did, right? I can control, and that is just wide open, infinite possibilities. What can you control? See, what it does is it starts to allow them to start to believe by real actions that, huh, I can't control this because I just did it. How can you tell me I can't walk when I see myself walking? <laughs> it really creates a lot of confidence, self-esteem, the ability to go from that can'tville to canville all on its own. So when you're not around, if it is to be, it's up to me plays that little software thing going, and you bet, I can control my body and my actions. Awesome. Yeah, so let's jump into another game. This one here would be called Blink, right? Think of the I. Do you remember this game? This might be a little freaky, but we're gonna play right now, ready? Uh, I think Bonnie just blinked. I lose. Yeah, that's the game. The game is to, I'm going to make you blink first. You're going to make me blink first, right? Mm -hmm. 
So when you think about it, <clears throat> our eye has a natural function that's already been in our unconscious. It's already been programmed in there to look, um, uh, lubricate the eye, right? It's a blink. It, it gets a little water in there and it blinks. So without you doing any conscious thought, your eye will just naturally blink. So do you have the ability to control that? Absolutely. You have a chance to override it with training. And the eye blink game, boy, I'll tell you what, we used to have these kids go head to head and they'd be like, fine, let's go ahead and play the blink game. And they would face up and boy, they get so excited. They're over here yes. going, they're like, like little Rocky ball bowlers. They're just getting into the zone. They're talking, they're chanting, going, okay, I'm going to blink, blink, blink. I got this. I got this. And then they're like game face. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Right. And they get into it. And so how awesome is it that that happens? I blink. You can control that. It's just a little subtlety. It's made into a game. So when people Amazing. feel, when, when the kids start to share, I can't, right? We know this. I can't. And they just melt down. Well, really, they just don't have anything connected there on how they can. They're relying on you to do it for them again, right? That's the default, which is kind of cute when they're young because it's one to two. You got to do everything for them. But at that transition point, we start doing things together. So when they start thinking, I can't, hey, do you remember uh, playing that I, uh, that I blink game? Remember how you were like a uh, family champion last night? You know, I used to believe that you can't. I really, really did. However, when I see you being a champ like that, what if you took that power and brought that to the table. Mm -hmm. You know, so many times when Bonnie asks the, the parents of, my child has this and they're all over the place. Well, great. Um, you told me earlier that your child plays video games for 10 hours straight. The first mm -hmm. thing that pops in my head is that kid's been snowing you. Mm -hmm. He's got self-control. Do you see? It's all about being able to tie a new thing together. All right. Yeah. Seeing the FedEx arrow because, um, gosh, it's so easy to, it's way easier to buy into the fact that they just can't help themselves rather than actually taking the time to help them develop those neural pathways. And we're just here to say that they can do it. And sometimes they just don't want to, which brings us back to the formula that I showed you, right? The child's goal, they earn it by engaging in working on these games with you. And you could start with just three minutes or five minutes at a time. It doesn't have to be an hour at a time, just little bits at a time and I know this because I'm learning to play the guitar right now and you know what can you imagine me buying a guitar picking it up and thinking that I'm gonna play stairway to heaven right away uh, yeah it's not gonna happen and in fact what I'm learning is here's a chord strum 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 <laughs> strum over and over again it's really boring but what's happening in the last month or so is i'm developing new neural pathways on how to hold my fingers and how to change chords and it's really exciting but it's going to be months before i can play a song how much does that make sense right so five minutes a day is all that my commitment is to this and it's actually working because sometimes you have fun in that five minutes and it actually expands to half an hour but um, anyway, that's my, my two cents on that. Yeah. And let me ask you, Bonnie, you have a vision of the goal to play a song, yep. which is what's driving that force. That's very key. We won't dive into it today, but just remember, you don't have to motivate them. They're self-motivated. Mm -hmm. That's Internally what's motivated. key. Very mm -hmm. key. All right. So let's jump down to number six, right? This is number four on the list, but we're working 10 to one. Okay. Simon says, I know I love, I see, I love that compliment. I, I don't remember you doing that, but Marta doesn't either. Cause she's going one, two, three. three. All right. Well, we'll recap. Okay. This is good. I spot or uh, Eagle. Eye was number one. I can control blank is number two, right? I blink is number three. And number four is going to be Simon Says. See, in the martial art class, when we would say, uh, it would be Kwan Jing Nim, right? That's uh, Korean. But we would play the same concept. I spy, 
then write in the Simon Says. So Simon Says really starts to put two things together. Remember stacking the blocks, the eye and the hand coordination? Now you've got ear and body coordination because uh, it's really a lot of listening. All right, so Simon Says. Do this. Yeah, do that, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then Simon mm. Says, grab your ears, right? Do the monkey ears, right? Go. No, Simon didn't say. <laughs> See, so many times we get caught up in actually watching the action that we just get hypnotized into the action and miss the cue. And your kids, your kids will catch you. That's right. So here they are playing the game and you said something. They didn't hear it. They didn't hear the trigger. Simon says, I told you no. Aren't you listening? Right. Everybody's correct there. Everything's working perfect. You saw something you didn't like, and then that's happened negative, negative, right? Mm -hmm. All right. How are we doing on time? We got to speed up? Yep. Okay. So Simon says, what a great way, because what that will end up doing is it allows them to help guide. This actual game helps to guide, because when they have a goal, they're looking to you to guide them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. What's the next step? All right, crack the eggs, put them in there. Mm -hmm. Simon says, put the eggs in there. Are you feeling me? Are you getting this? Right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a thumbs up, a yes, or a, I don't get it. All right. Next one, number five. This is going to be red light, green light. Oh, right. So now we're starting to tie a little visual, get some hearing, got the body coordination going. This one was always fun because we had the classroom. You can do this in a hall. You can do it in the, in the bedroom or you can do it in the living room, wherever you got some space. Go outside, go in the backyard. You got it. So when you play the red light, green light, you'd have somebody on this end, you'd have them on the other end, and, they're, and the goal is to be the first one to get to the cop or the one that's controlling the lights, right? This is the one that you see um, the traffic one, he's, he's doing the traffic. So they turn around and they yell green light because the cop is now not looking. You're not looking at the kids that are slowly moving forward because as soon as you at any time, they know red light, they got to automatically Control. freeze, right? They got to hear it, see you turning and then go, everybody stop as they're talking to their body, right? They're tuning in going, rut row, rut row, rut. <clears throat> that right there as, as, as silly and as like, uh, yeah, duh, common sense, hello, as it might be, it's that repetition that builds the muscle for the child. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say that one more time. It's the repetition that builds the muscle for the child, of course, you've got it. You've got 20, 30, 40, some grandparents are doing their grandkids in this program, right? They got 80 years on them, of course you can. But it's that kid's brain that is yet to get the missing life skill. Ah, I like this stuff, light bulb, mm -hmm. big explosions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Red light, green light, it also ties into that universal law of cause and effect, right? It's very awesome. Okay, let's go into number six. This game, if you have a pool, I remember being introduced to this in a pool. It was called Marco Polo, <laughs> right? Because the voices are gonna be in two different areas and the visual is taken out of the game. Mm -hmm. Very key, right? So now you're, think of how powerful this is. You're in a place, that the child can't see. A dark area, late at night, you write something and you're looking to connect. Marco, you're in a crowd, you're yelling out their name. They're hearing it, right? It's a game. It, we don't really appreciate it until it's already in place and you got it, mm -hmm. right? But that's where Marco and Polo would tie in. You can play it anywhere. Have the one that's blindfolded. It could be even be a tag game. They're in the backyard. You put on the blindfold and 
they're out there going, okay, I know you're in, and everybody's being as quiet as possible to move and not get touched, right? Because now they're listening for footsteps. I hear somebody over here. It really starts to stimulate the sensory so it can actually put it together. When you yell out Marco, they have to yell Polo, and that's part of connecting of depth perception. It would almost be that radar that the bat uses because it's completely blind. Huh? It's pretty cool. Missing life skills. Let's jump into, what are we at here? That's number five. We got number six, right? And for those that know sign language, that's six. Okay. Let's go with Jenga. When were you introduced to the game called Jenga? That's the little, little uh, pieces of wood that you stack up yay tall. And the idea, is that seven? Ooh, it is seven. So technically, it would be that, seven. Mm -hmm. All right. Nice talk. I know. <laughs> okay, so Jenga. Let's get back to Jenga. Jenga is the one that really develops the missing life skill of vision. It gets them to think, not in the impulsive moment now, but one, two, three steps ahead, because this step here is going to affect something later, mm -hmm. right? Because the idea is to be able to find the piece that's soft or that can move, and you're tapping it out, picking it up, and setting it back on top, and it starts to keep growing vertical with the inevitable that it will fall over. However, you would like yours to pass, your opponents to fail brings on that type of game. What are you seeing and strategy? There's the Jenga game. That's awesome. All right. So here, here we are at number eight. Mother May I. Who remembers this one? Do you remember playing Mother May I? No. I don't think, I, I don't think those <laughs> words were in my vocabulary. <laughs> right. Because without this training, it would have just looked like what? Right. I'm just going to go do it. I don't need to ask. <laughs> Instead, my mom ran around the house going, I can't spank you. How do I get you to listen to me? I remember that. <laughs> no childhood games. Right. Yeah. And why would you ask if they always kept saying no? That's don't, right. can't. Mom, anyway. can I? No. Yeah, exactly. So what it did is it basically taught them how to lie, cheat, and steal and do it without asking. But the mother may I is one of those neat games that starts the process that every time you're out and about, your child sees a stack of cookies and they just go for it. And you're like, uh-oh, I know my little Tommy. He's just going to eat the whole plate. I can just feel it already. What does every single parent out there always say to their child when they're in training mode in the field? Manners. Well, somebody might type in, make sure you ask first because oh. it's not yours. Huh? Ring, ring a bell, right? So playing mother may I allows them to have somebody on this side and you got all the other kids on the other side. And the idea is they're trying to get themselves to you, right? Keyword is try. They're going to go from here to there because they have to ask a question. Mother, may I? And you would say, well, what is it you would like to do? I would like to take, and you can leave it simple of like, I would like to take, um, hmm. I would like to take, a step. Mother, may I take a step? And you would answer yes or no. Yes, you can. Mother, may I take one, two, or three steps? And they would answer. And then they could actually move strategically forward. Cool. Right? So the idea is just to ask a question first because that will always put you in the best position later on when a child goes, hey, mom, uh, mother, may I have sex? Mother, may I have a drink? You know, those things that they're going to get into that we don't want to talk about. But wouldn't you rather have them ask you first versus finding out later with a phone call? That's the power of how these games will play out in the future. Very important. Yeah. All right. So let's go with number nine. Number nine, musical chairs slash freeze dance. All right. What we're doing is we're bringing in uh, music to it, right? We're bringing it into the tempo. We're bringing it into the, oh yeah, starting to get the groove, right? You get the, the music always, you've heard that song, you always get that one step and it just goes. 
So you get the music started with the kids. Now the first one is do something. It's, it's that dance. Just get your body to move. Let them embrace their own uniqueness and whatever it is. The music's playing. Somebody might just be sitting there like that. You'll get the other kid who's totally hyper and he's just going into his full on spaz, just whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you stop the music. Mm -hmm. And once again, it allows them to be okay. Not only am I going to be stopping myself because I choose to play the game to stay in, but if I'm the last one that's caught not freezing, then I get to sit out, right? Or you just play the start and stop. Let the music start, get them moving, hit the stop, and eventually they stop, right? Just let them play. Just let them engage. Just getting going. Music on, off. Yeah. On, off. What we're really doing is we're starting to program the brain for opposites, right? Because that's really what's happening here, on, off, like a light switch, giving them some software to upgrade. Now, you can take this the next step further and include chairs. How many of us remember musical chairs? Come on, Bonnie, you had to be playing that game. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now, this is so key. Has any of your kids panicked, have anxiety? start to get scared and be like, mom, right? They're calling out dad, right? That's because there's another element that's added called a clock or a perceived uh, sense of scarcity, not an abundance. Like you're not there to just give everything. All of a sudden they're in an environment that's starting to go, well, wait a minute, there's 10 kids and nine chairs. That means one of us is not making it. Yeah. Ready, go. Right. right. So what it does is it's starting to actually create that first little baby steps of what we've been uh, just coming to the rescue, right? Sometimes we have those horror stories, right? They're still 20 and they're still coming back to mom, right? Yes. Okay. So see the value of this. So now they get down to nine. Then there's eight, right? Seven. If you, if you aren't sitting on a chair, you get moved out. Then it gets all the way down to two kids, one chair, and watch them start strategizing. They really start to get into it being creative. They know which side it is. You just watch them naturally grow. It's awesome to watch. However, they get stimulated in a way to know that when things start to get scarce or time is running out, okay, we gotta hurry up and get to school, guys. Huh? We're running late they'll already know the musical chair. It's already been programmed in. You seen the value? Okay, guys, we're heading off to school. How are we gonna do? Do you see how you can start to correlate them and you can start to have them know that they can do it because they've already proved it in playing the games. If you're with me on this, give me a thumbs up or say yes. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, awesome. this is great. Actually, we used to do that uh, for school rides in the morning. We almost played musical chairs because it would be like the first one out to the car gets to sit in the front seat and choose the music. And so Ooh. they were they were always on time. Yeah. <laughs> let's, 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 uh, we'll give you a little insight, right? We got a minute here. So when the kids wanted to get to the vehicle, I remember when they first started on, they had carte blanche of everything, right? They'd be running everything in Bonnie's car. Yeah. I mean, they just thought the radio was theirs. Okay. That's right. <laughs> and my phone. And my yeah, phone. everything. All right. So if they have a goal to listen to the music, right, then they had to be, well, first off, if they wanted a ride, they got to be at a certain time, right? So you can learn like a bus doesn't wait for you, right? You're late, you miss it, you're walking, you, you earned it. So if you want to get out to the car by a certain time, then first come, first serve, gets to pick which chair, right? Early bird gets the worm. If you want to get the front seat, you got to be first. Huh? You don't have to ask them anything. It's all self-motivated. Yeah. You see, it tied us in. Then when you get in, and if everybody meets it by a certain time, then we can actually listen to the music. That starts to create a little teamwork, right? Very important. So when you got the slacker, the other two are kind of like, you know, we all have a common goal here. We'd all like to listen to it. We got to make a little bit of compromise. Maybe there's something I can help you out. You start seeing the, your siblings, or in this case, your offspring, starting to work together without you having to herd up all the cats, 
If you've ever oh. tried herding cats. And if you're a client of ours watching this and you've had this experience with your children, now would be a really great time for like one of those hearts because I love seeing all the hearts. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now let's go ahead and let's get to number 10. People always ask, well, what's your favorite? And this would be it hands down. Mm -hmm. It's called follow the leader. Mm -hmm. Love follow the leader. There's so many, I mean, there's infinite possibilities of being able to play follow the leader because it follows all of natural laws. It's such an amazing thing. So here's one of the best places to do follow the leader. You know, you see a child doing something, they're looking to you to show them how it works. Well, nine times out of 10, anytime I see a child, he always defaults to be the leader. So I start following him right? And they're like, what are you doing? Well, I was just playing follow the leader. I thought you were the leader, <laughs> right? And, like, well, and then they get a little kind of funny, like, well, I don't want to be the leader. And then they're like, oh, okay, well, can I be the leader? And they're like, okay. And the <laughs> next thing you know, the kids are following you. And then what I'm doing is you start to demonstrate no words, right? I'm not dictating. Okay. You got to pick that up. Yeah. I go, I pick it up and put it over there. And then I pick it, and then they know to pick up one over there. So when you're out in the yard, the kids can be like, okay, if I hopped over the log, they gotta hop over the log. It's one of the neatest games. And if you can stay in there long enough, you can get to the front so everybody takes turns. But as you get the idea, following the leader is one of the best times to demonstrate I am in control of my body and my actions. And some of you have been doing this in the boot camp, right? You and your self-control training, sitting still for five minutes, right? May not seem like much, but wow, there's a really a lot to this. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> Here I am in my 30s, 40s, or 50s, and I'm not even able to sit still. I'm impulsive. And I'm telling them to not be impulsive. No wonder they're falling. They're doing great. They're following the leader. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's a few windows. One is mealtime. If you believe that it would make sense, as crazy as this sounds, that the child has their hands washed, right, before they come sit down, and they actually sit like this. You know, maybe their hands together on the table, maybe their hands to themselves, back straight, just <sighs> quiet. Now, you might have one child, 50 kids, anywhere in between. It's once again, who would like the front seat? So in, instead of like setting it up and telling them what to do, I would actually come to the dinner table. I would sit down. Oh, yeah, they're running around doing whatever. They don't know. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting down, and I just sat there, and it's just quiet. They may not even recognize. You're just like, what's he doing? Doing nothing. Yep. And then the little egg timer goes, ding. Right, you can set it for one minute, 30 seconds. It's, it's irrelevant, mm -hmm. just get it to go, ding. And then, oh boy, I got my self-control training down. And then I get up and I go grab my plate and I can start serving myself. And then the child wants to actually do the same. Now, what would they do if they wanted to? They see the monkey see monkey do. You can start tying this in to whoever sits first or sits the best or can make a certain amount of time, that's what makes the plate show up. Just a simple cause and effect. Are you really asking for too much if you'd like your child to be quiet before they get served? Not really. It's baby steps, very exciting. Follow the leader. The possibilities are absolutely infinite of what you can do with these childhood games once you just do something, yeah. get them started. That's awesome. That's awesome. Tom gets a round of applause. 10 childhood games, very simple games that can teach your child self-control and actually focus. Okay, so if you were here before we actually started, I said that if you wanted to participate with me to go find yourself two jars, write love on one and anger on the other. You could even put understanding on one and love on, or, and anger on the other, or you could put punishment on one, guiding on the other. In fact, I'll take a picture of my jars when I'm done because I'll probably have anger, jealousy, 
um, hate, destruction, right? Aggressive behavior on one. <laughs> and on the other one, I'm going to put love, joy, harmony, teamwork, peace, and all of that. And then what I'm going to do is, okay, hold up these two jars. All right. Well, okay. while, while you're doing that, Bonnie, I was, it, it really just sounds like you need positive and negative. You put whatever word you want. Right? Yeah, we're talking about parenting and we're talking about the formula, the universal laws that positive plus positive will give you more positive, negative plus negative will give you negative. And I, I want to do this exercise with you so that you can like literally see. And if you could do this at home, you just take an apple, it's just a regular apple, and I'm going to cut it in half. I'm going to cut it in half again because um, it won't fit in the jar. <laughs> <laughs> Chris's, Chris's ham story. I needed to have a bigger mouth. <laughs> Just because I cut mine in half twice doesn't mean you have to if your whole apple will fit in the jar. Okay, so this apple is going to go in the jar. I'm going to put the lid on it and I'm just going to walk by this jar every day and I'm going to say, no, we don't do that. That's bad. You're in a timeout. Stop it. I'm going to talk to the apple this way. And on the other apple, I'm going to cut it in half. I'm going to put it in the love jar and I'm going to guide with love with its goal first. <laughs> so I'm going to walk by this jar and go, I would love for you to be a yummy apple. And I know it sounds creepy or whatever, but the results are even creepier. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll just show a kind of a picture every day. And then on next Thursday's webinar, I'll show you where the apples are at. If you want to do it at home, you'll see the same results. Um, and then within about a week or two, um, it'll just be undeniable that negative words, negative thoughts, negative actions have a vibration attached that affect everything around it. Uh, whereas positive words, feelings, and actions will do the opposite to, to anything. So if you're going to see this in an apple, you could imagine what we do to our children sometimes when we are uh, responding in anger. Uh, and it's just awareness. Like I said, if you're experiencing this, it's not your fault. It's not anybody's fault. Um, I was in the exact same place too. And I was a success coach. So I knew better but I didn't know how to bring it into my home. Uh, if you love what we're sharing and you are finding like, oh, I love all this stuff, but I need a little support, uh, in the description above, I'm going to add a discovery session. You wanna speak with us for five to 10 minutes, you'll know that uh, if what you're looking for and what we do to help parents could be a possible match, and that's a really nice starting point. So thank you so much, um, everybody, for joining. We just love this. We're so excited. I can't believe the hour passes so quickly on the five minutes before when we were on mute. It was going so slowly. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Share your comments, observations, or any questions that you have below the video, and we'll get with you as soon as we possibly can. Have a great night.